everybody knows they don't want to do their own books and they don't want to pay their own taxes. You want to pay somebody else to do that. But how do you know that you're hiring a good one? How do you set expectations around that? Uh, so we focus on those back end decision making processes, which are a little more evergreen. Um, because that's the other thing that's true is Facebook ads are a great example. Uh, Meta is kind of struggling right now a little bit. A lot of people are leaving Facebook. They're doing all these big layoffs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in that right now. Is Facebook going to be around in two years? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Jesse. Jesse, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So give us the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. Yeah, I, my name is Jesse. I live out in Western Colorado in the United States, if you happen to be in a country that is not the US. <laughs> uh, and I run a company called Out Your Garage. And our goal is to support small businesses, generally businesses less than five employees. Uh, our goal is to support those small businesses through that first growth stage where you know a lot about what your business does, and basically nothing about running a business. And every day you're like, I didn't know I didn't know that. And now I have been problem. There are problems in my business from this thing I did not know. Where do I start? How do I fix it? What do we do now? Uh, so we do online courses, virtual webinars, and virtual co-working to help those businesses through that process so that they can grow and become community institutions. Nice. I love it. So we will get into that in a minute, but I want to know where does the name Outgrow Your Garage come from? So one of my favorite things about uh, this American mythos of the American dream where you can go and you can have this dream and then you turn it into a reality and then you have all the money you could ever want and all the happiness you could ever dreamed of and the best spouse and 27 pets and whatever you want uh, in your in your American dream. We have this cultural idea of you start those businesses in your garage, you start them in your basement, you start them in your back room, right? We talk about it with Amazon, we talk about it in Microsoft, we talk about it with Facebook, these, these game changing companies that they started it in their garage. Um, and then we have the same conception with the arts, right? You have your garage bands, you have your garage studios, right? You started in this back shed, and then it grew out of that into this thing that became bigger than you and bigger than uh, your garage and bigger than what that original baby dream of, which was, you know, I just want to revamp how books work, or I just want to make good music or whatever that thing you did in your garage. Um, we help you make it bigger so that you can expand to whatever level you're comfortable with in your business and achieve whatever the American dream looks like to you. I love it. So how did you get into kind of this area of helping entrepreneurs from that in that um, position in their business? Why that yeah, one? Yeah. So my background is actually in landscaping and in the services. And so one of the things that was true when I started my landscaping business, and I like so many other people in the trades and services, whether you're a landscaper, whether you're a house cleaner, whether you're a plumber or whatever, um, I started my business in my house with myself and no capital to speak of whatsoever and went great. However many billable hours I work, then that's how much dollars I have in order to pay my rent and pay my other bills and make these things happen. And so at the time I knew a lot about plants. I knew nothing about running a business. And I very, very quickly discovered that if you are in this bracket of home-based businesses, whether you're mobile or not, uh, there are not a lot of resources for you in terms of how to run a business. So I had to figure out seasonal employment law. And I had to figure out how do I pay city of Denver taxes because I work in Denver, but my business is not based in Denver. And how do all these things work? And how do I set expectations? How do I delegate these pieces of my business to other people? And I had to learn all this stuff. And it was an atrocious learning process. And I cried all the time. And I am not being facetious. Like I would come home exhausted from 10 hours of work doing hard manual labor and I would have to figure out my taxes and I would be in tears trying to figure out these business pieces. And my husband would bring me a, bring me dinner and be like, yes, dear, here you go. Um, and it was really hard. It was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and I've done some really hard things in my life. And, um, so that process of learning, uh, really made me realize what this gap is in terms of how do we support these small community-based businesses that are really the backbone of a lot of economies 
It doesn't matter how good your uh, local economy is when a pipe bursts in your crawl space at two o'clock in the morning, which is a real thing that happened to me about a month ago. Um, I don't want to watch a YouTube video. I don't want to call up somebody to talk me through the process. Crawl up into about the it. crawl space with a laptop right. going, I think this is a part. Right. I, I want goes somebody out. to show up and fix my plumbing. <laughs> Right? right? Like that's what you want. And so these businesses are vital to the ability for us to function in the world. And so supporting these trades businesses and these mobile businesses and these home-based services are really key to, to having a thriving economy across the board. So um, I took all that learning. And when I wanted to move from Denver into a more rural part of, a, of the state, I went, all right, let's do it. We're going to turn this into an education company. <laughs> so you moved away from people so that you could serve more people. I like it. <laughs> so Exactly. I love that phrasing. <laughs> awesome. So when you're working with people, what does that look like? Are you looking at kind of any businesses? Do you focus in on certain ones? Are you looking at operations versus, you know, accounting? And like, there is a big yeah. mess of things called business. <laughs> a lot of opportunities. So many things. <laughs> Uh, so my focus is operations, right? right? And part of why my focus is operations is I'm a logistics person. I like logistics. I like systems. I like taking things that are full of chaos and going, okay, how can we do this in a way that makes sense and not just makes sense, but makes sense for the people who actually have to implement that project. Um, and operations, I think, is a really overlooked place in a lot of business development resources uh, because it's kind of wonky, right? It's really different by industry. It's really different by who is thinking about the operations. It's different based on your geographic area and what your supply chain looks like and all these different pieces. And I love that process. How do you design the system of thinking about what will work for your business is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. So uh, Alcari Garage, also because we serve these mobile businesses that are often done in person, whether that's your plumbers or your food trucks, um, because we serve that style of business where the owner is usually still doing the day-to-day -day business pieces, you don't have time to go to an hour-long lunch lunchtime webinar. That's when you're talking with clients. Um, you don't have time to do an hour-long dinnertime web webinar. That's when you're feeding your kids. Um, so how do we create programming that really fits into the needs of people's day-to-day -day lives? Uh, so we do mostly on-demand downloadable courses. They're broken into these little five-minute videos. Uh, so a whole course might have an hour, an hour and a half's worth of content. And then within that, you have a bunch of small modules. They're, they all can be done within a 20-minute chunk of time. They are specifically designed for, uh, I am waiting in the car line to pick up my child from school. I have 15 minutes. Okay, great. I can watch the video and I can do the activity. Uh, they're really designed for those kinds of pieces. And you can download everything, which I live in rural Colorado. We don't have internet everywhere. We don't have cell service everywhere. Um, the mountains in Colorado are so big and cause so many problems with communication that it is an actual problem for our firefighting communities when we get wildfires in Colorado because they can't communicate across the canyons. So it's, it's a huge issue here. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everything I had was downloadable. You could go to the library, you could download it, you could download it while you're at home. You could put everything in as a podcast, you could download the audio file if you wanted. And so you can really absorb the knowledge in a way that works for your learning style, for your schedule, for your internet access, however that works um, and do these little things in pieces. And that process of building your business in these little 20 minute chunks at the end of a course, you have a thing, whether that's a hiring plan, whether that's a sales process, whether that's a budget. Uh, we have a whole course I love on pricing your services, which is a thing that it, when you look up how, how do I price things in my business, everybody's like, oh, yeah, start with your cost of goods. Great. How much is my time worth? I don't know. <laughs> Silence um, crickets. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. So figuring those pieces out is is a huge thing. And so um, my goal is really how do we diversify that that information uh, and make it accessible to anybody who needs it, not just people who have the time to go to these lunchtime and and um, during the day webinars that have really great super awesome information, um, but also for the people who are just starting out and all their money is tied up in the business. 
And so our courses are $125. You can buy them a la carte. So there's not like this $5,000 program that's going to tell you how to do all the pieces of your business. There's one course on the one thing you need right now, and you can implement it. And three months later, when you need something else, come on back. We've got something else for you. Nice. I love it. And so is there a a course that tells you how to take the courses? Because <laughs> so like, a lot of people are like, oh, I need Facebook ads. It's like, no, you don't. You need a product. <laughs> what are you doing back up the bus stop um because yeah. so many people i see that and it's like they and again they just don't know what they don't know right they're mm -hmm. they heard something from somebody that said oh yeah this is going to be good and this is make all the difference in your business and mm -hmm. in due time it is um so our focus is always how do we help you determine what you need that's always the first step and so my theory is always business owners do they often know what they need. They just don't know what those first couple steps are to get it, right? So you know you need marketing. Okay, what does that look like for your business? And then you talk to a marketing person and they go, okay, well, what's your demographic and how do you represent your brand? And you're like, I know what some of those words mean individually. I don't know. Um, and so our focus with our courses is really, how do we get you through those first couple steps of being able to talk about the things you don't know? How do we get you comfortable with terminology? Um, whether that's being confident enough to hire an accountant or a bookkeeper, right? Everybody knows they don't want to do their own books and they don't want to pay their own taxes. You want to pay somebody else to do that. But how do you know that you're hiring a good one? How do you set expectations around that? Uh, so we focus on those backend decision-making processes, which are a little more evergreen. Um, because that's the other thing that's true is Facebook ads are a great example. Uh, Meta is kind of struggling right now a little bit. A lot of people are leaving Facebook. They're doing all these big layoffs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in that right now. Is Facebook going to be around in two years? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, but how do I reach my audience and how do I pay attention to those trends? And do I actually, as a business owner, want to pay attention to those things? Or do I want to outsource it entirely? Those are questions that you have to answer all the time. And so we focus on that decision-making process across the board. And what are those first couple steps and how do you decide what you need? Um, and for anybody who's curious about them, we have the introductions to every single course are free all the time. So you can watch the introductions and it tells you exactly what's in a course and exactly what all the activities are and exactly what you'll end with, because I don't want people to pay me money unless they are sure that I am offering them what they need. I love that. Well, and you bring up a great point. The <laughs> what do you need when you need it, and how do you make that decision? And understanding too that the way somebody makes a startup decision is going to be totally different than the way they set up a growth decision, which is going to be. <laughs> it's like at some point, it's like I don't care, just do it. <laughs> at some point, it's like wait, this is a business strategy decision. This is bigger than just what do you want to use. <laughs> Yeah. All yeah. the fun parts that come along with business and, and getting set up. So I love it. And I love that you look at kind of all the areas of the business um, because it is pertinent. And some people might go, oh, you know, that that sales thing, I'm, I totally got it down pat. But the marketing thing, not so much so, or the, to your point, the pricing thing. Um, and they really can be very different conversations, especially um, I find when people think they know enough to know <laughs> but, but then it's not working they don't know why it doesn't work and it's like okay time to go back to basics and figure this out so then it ends up being for everyone exactly and i believe that everything is fundamentally an operations process um because in in a business every aspect of your organization people have to know how to do the thing so that other people can find the information they need um whether that's you are a solopreneur and you have to remember where you wrote down information about that project that you were supposed to reach out to a client about in six months and now it's six months and you have to go oh, wait i have to they said follow up in september and now it's september and i have to do the thing um so how do you track that information? You need a process for that. Uh, and so all of these pieces, or whether you're a growing company and you have 10 people, if you want to hire in somebody new, it's going to be a lot easier if you've written down your processes and say, here's how we do things. Here's where the documentation is so that you can then make those decisions. So for me, everything really comes back to not just 
what is the knowledge set in this business, but how does information flow through the business so that people can find what they need in order to do their jobs well? Um, and if you're a growing business, how do you get the information out of people's heads and written down so that training those new people coming in is way easier? Um, I had the opportunity to help form the hiring process at a startup who had recently gotten their Series A not that long ago, which is a little outside my normal demographic, but um, it was a ton of fun of going, how do you teach a recruiter and how do you set expectations for a recruiter to determine whether or not an engineer should get passed on through the process when they needed really specific technical skills. And so you're thinking about these different pieces and how do you put them together so that you can say, here's the checklist, here's what we're gonna evaluate every candidate on, here's what we're gonna talk about in the interview and the process is gonna be the same. So everybody knows what moves a candidate from one round to the next, everybody's asking the same question and we're removing as much bias out of the process and inserting as much flexibility into the process as we can. And that was a super fun project. Nice. I love that. Well, and it also brings up the, how often do you go and review these things? Because I know a lot of people will, they'll take all the information from the course. They'll use it for their onboarding. That's fantastic. Somebody's trained. Yay. They're doing it right. And then six months down the road, yeah, they're doing it perfectly and nobody knows what they're doing or how they're doing it because they've just taken on a whole life of its own. And we dropped the SOPs and we dropped the project management software. And we, oh, that never happens yeah. in other businesses, does it? No. no. Once you get organized once, you never have to do it again. That's, right? that's how I think it works, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um, one of the things I really emphasize in everything I say all the time is you have to cultivate this culture of learning, right? You're in order for your business to be successful, you have to be curious about what makes your business successful and how you can operate it, right? You're always growing and changing. Um, so being aware of that in a business helps trigger that idea of what do we need to do to make this better? Um, and because our courses are on demand, I don't have a ton of direct contact with the organizations who are taking those courses. Um, but some things that we've recently started doing are working with people like business coaches and bookkeepers and other organizations who work with small businesses. Uh, we work with a lending institution. We work with some local governments. We work with local libraries to help train them in how to use our programming as an add-on. So for people who really want that um, hands-on support, where they're getting those regular touch points, they can use existing community resources. And then those community resources or their business coach or their bookkeeper or whoever can come and say, take this course, here's the fundamentals, go back to it, and then we're going to handle it over here. Um, and that's been really successful in terms of helping connect people to different resources. And then we also run a virtual co-working twice a week that's free that anyone can come to. And that's really fun too, because we have this collection of business owners and people show up with their problems and we troubleshoot. And sometimes you just need somebody else to have a second brain to help you solve the problem or make sure that you actually did spell your own business name right on the business card that you've been designing in Vistaprint for two hours and you're like fiddling with all the things and you've looked at your own name so many times you're like I don't is that how you spell after your garage did I did I type that right um sometimes that happens and then you can say great please somebody else look at this card tell me that I spelled everything right and um we have it so we do a ton of that in co-working and it's really nice. fun Never well, and I love that it's an opportunity for everybody to be able to jump in because for me, it makes a huge difference to, to be able to bounce ideas off of somebody and, and creativity wise to be able to do that. Not to mention, yeah, we did order a couple of thousand pens with the wrong phone number on them. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately our designer caught it and went, that is a lovely number and it looks great, but it's not yours. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you caught yeah. that before we went to print, right? Yeah. yeah okay, good. <laughs> Yep. We fell over in our own proofreading uh, mm -hmm. adventures this week and the newsletter that went out for Outgrade Garage on Monday, uh, which for this is being recorded in towards the end of May. Mm -hmm. And our newsletter said that our next webinar would be in the middle of May, two weeks beforehand, instead of <laughs> in the middle of June, which is when it actually would happen. And, right. and when time gets away from me, it's like, what? It's only January. What are you talking about? <laughs> 
right? Yeah. And we had a system, theoretically, to proofread for exactly that thing. But guess who was supposed to proofread it and didn't? That that would be me. Me. I was supposed to proofread. I didn't do it. And then Never I count on the, the CEO, man. Never. Like, right? <laughs> Terrible. Uh, so, so sometimes you got to recognize those things. Like, that's we changed the process. We went, great. Jesse's not responsible for this anymore because this is how <laughs> things fall through the cracks. Exactly. And that's how I find I get out of jobs. It's like, oh, good. I screwed that up. Oh, who, who's taking them? Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. So can you give us an example of a Cinderella story of one of your clients? Um, so one of my favorite businesses that we work with is a, or who has been showing up for a while, um, is a speech therapist. And she left the world of in-school speech therapy because, uh, for anybody who has worked in schools or early childhood healthcare, um, those industries are really hard. And it is hard to be in early childhood education and it's hard to be in healthcare and it's super hard to be in the overlap of those two industries. And so she went, you know what, I'm done. I don't wanna do this anymore. I'm gonna figure out how to start my own business. I'm gonna take private clients. Um, And if you do that, one of the things you have to figure out is how do you take Medicare and how do you take Medicaid and how do you deal with um, internal school stuff and things that the school pays for and things for the government that pays for and how do you handle educating parents on the difference between this kid doesn't have a speech impediment they just didn't learn English as their first language and um, they do have a speech impediment but we're going to work on it work out versus this is part of a wider learning disability whatever um, so really figuring out all those pieces and so when you're in a business that requires that much thought in just the day-to-day business stuff, it's really hard to figure out how do you set your pricing and how do you do all the different pieces to even start the business, right? What, how do you claim a website? Do you need a website? Do you need a social media? What is your basic marketing? How do you have the time to look up what things are legal and what are not legal in terms of starting a childcare and a healthcare business? How do you handle HIPAA laws? Um, And so some of those are things that I can't help with. I know nothing about HIPAA laws. I know nothing about uh, how to protect the privacy of minors, other than that I don't work with minors. And that's how I personally solve that issue. Um, Which is great. By the way, is one of the fastest, easiest ways to deal with that. (laughs) Right? Yeah, it's really easy. It requires no work on my part. It's a much harder line to hold if your primary client is aged two to six. Um, So I can't help with those things. But what I could do is say, here are the courses that will help you with pricing your services. Here are the courses that will help with delegating out information. Here are the courses that will help you refine the processes of your business so that you don't have to think about those. You can think about how do I deal with HIPAA and how do I talk to clients and how do I deal with all these things? And she used all of our templates. And so the backend operations of her business were really easy. And now here she is eight months later, fully on her own, having totally left her job and going, I wouldn't have been able to do this as quickly if I had to figure out all this on my own. And so just having that mental break of these pieces are solved. I just have to fill in the answers on the worksheets. And then it's all written down and I can just do those things. I can just check the things off the checkbox. It removes so much of that mental pressure of, oh God, my to-do list is overwhelming. And that's my favorite part about working with small businesses is you get to actually watch people unclench and calm down and their shoulders drop and then feel like they can take a deep breath. And that's just such a fun process. Right. It is one of the best parts of, of entrepreneurialness is when you (laughs) is watching people when they get it. (laughs) It's like, yay, you're, you're on the road with me. This is awesome. I love it. So Obviously, the stumbling blocks that somebody's going through is just sheer overwhelm from <laughs> entrepreneurialness and not knowing what to do when or what they don't know and trying to figure out all this escapes. If you could kind of draw a picture, because oftentimes I will go really in business, <laughs> there's only marketing, sales, and accounting, <laughs> like money. <laughs> That's, those are really the three compartments. Once you got those three, you're good. But I mean, obviously, business is a lot more complex than that. How do you divvy up? Um, what entrepreneurial thisness is, and uh, let's start there. I think in a business, so one of the things, there's a couple of things that are true about how I think about business. One is that um, running your own business is really hard. And for most people, you only do it if you don't have another option. 
<laughs> and and you might not have another option for any pile of reasons, right? Maybe you're a single parent and you're having a hard time finding a job that you can work around your childcare schedule. Uh, maybe you are like me and you have uh, 12 learning disabilities in a trench coat, which makes it really hard to operate in a traditional workspace. And also I'm pretty opinionated um, and that a lot of people did not love when I was just like me and you have attitude and control issues. Right. Oh yeah. You're really interested in this. That's thank you for sharing (laughs) is, you know, phrases that people would say to me. Um, So having those, those pieces um, in terms of why you start a business, it's really important to understand that if there were an easier path, most people are going to take it, right? There are easier ways to earn money than (laughs) starting a business, which is hard and it's draining. And I know people who have both had kids and started businesses and a couple superhero people who have had their first kid while starting a business and props to you. Excellent work. Uh, I commend your uh, lack of need for sleep, I guess. Um, (laughs) You know, and and they say having a kid and starting a business is fairly comparable in terms of the hardness of it and the amount of energy and the amount of brain power it takes. And so being realistic about that is a huge thing that I think we're we're not always there, right? People think I can do this. Um, and so being realistic about what you can do with your time and how much energy you can devote is the first thing that I think we don't do enough of. But then for me, once you get that business going a little bit, Everything is either, is this a process that I'm going to do more than once? Or is this a one-time thing that I just have to get through right now in order to go through the learning curve to be able to do it better the next time? And so being really realistic about where do you actually need a process so you're not reinventing the wheel, if you can make that delineation as an entrepreneur, everything else becomes so much easier because you're right, it is all about the money. And if you can have a process, you can track that money and you know whether or not you're profitable, you know whether or not things work, uh, and you can build everything else around that. And if you don't know where your money's going and you don't have a process for determining that, then you're always going to be in that cycle of, um, oh, I have enough work. Great. I don't have to market anymore. Oh, God, I don't have any more work because I didn't market while I had work. And now I have to do a lot of marketing. And oh, God, now I don't ha- now I have too much work and I'm overwhelmed again. So you got to get off that roller coaster if you want a stable business. And process is how you get off that roller coaster. So I'm always in the camp of, is it a process or is it not? Love that. And that's your first delineation. So I know our listeners are going to want more from you. How do they start their journey with you? Uh, So if you want to come find me specifically, the easiest way to find me is to come to a co-working session. And if you want to know when those co-working sessions are, uh, they are all on our website, which is www.outgrowyourgarage.com. Uh, and if you click on the upcoming events, it tells you our co-working dates and whatever webinars are coming up. We do a webinar once a month. Um, and then the other way to track us down, we are on Facebook. We are on LinkedIn. I personally am not on Facebook in any kind of meaningful capacity, but I am on LinkedIn. So you can track me down there as well. I love it. So we will, of course, have all of Jesse's links in the show notes. So scroll down, click on the links, open them in a new browser because we're not done yet. So Jesse, at what point in life did you know that you were that special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? Uh, it was an accident, actually. Uh, I worked in environmental education for a long time and I loved it. And I taught ecology to middle schoolers, um, which is a really fun and exciting adventure. I love middle schoolers. I think they're great. I also really love that they went home at the end of the day, which made it a lot easier to love teaching them. Um <laughs> but I loved working with them. And, but eventually I needed to make more than $300 a week. And I'd been working in environmental education for a long time. And I went, all right, I guess I'm going to make the transition to uh, working in a year round job. I'd never had a year round job before I was in my thirties. I'm going to look for something that involves a little less travel, something that I don't have to live on site. A lot of environmental ed jobs you're living on site. It's like summer camp, but during the school year. Uh, So I took this job at an arts nonprofit. And it was the worst thing I have ever done. Like, it just did not suit me at all. Um, I had to show up every day, even when there wasn't work. And people came and they talked to me and I couldn't set my own schedule. And everything about it was just not in realm with what I was trying to do. And I went, okay, how do I make a living wage, still work seasonally, 
and still be able to be outside. And I went landscaping. Landscaping is how I can do that. So I started the landscaping company and that was seven years ago, maybe. I don't know how many years ago that was now. Um, and I went, oh yeah, no, I'm never working for anybody again. This is great. Nice. Uh, I love that's, that. That's how that goes. <laughs> that's going on. Wow. We have a lot more in common than <laughs> Jesse, you've been absolutely awesome. Any last words for our peeps? If you have business questions, come find me. I love weird business logistical questions. So if you need some help, just come ask. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Absolutely. Have a great day, y'all. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention. You do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap. They offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.